pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Go ahead and call the roll. Trustee Sperling. Here. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Heinz. Yay. Trustee Youngerman. Here. Trustee Mersek. Yes. Here. And Trustee Bond. All right, we do have a quorum this evening. Uh, go ahead and uh, move on to public participation. This is the uh, public comment period. Two minutes for any member of the audience to address the board on any topic. If you are here um, regarding any of the topics that are on the agenda, please speak now so we can uh, hear uh, your thoughts and your concerns before we get into discussion later on. I suspect that we do have uh, individuals, so if you can uh, come down to the podium, uh, sign in so we have your name and address, and uh, thank you. Good evening, my name is Chad Davis, and it's been about two weeks since I was last here to speak regarding backyard chickens. This seems to be an up and coming trend amongst many municipalities around the country and locally. I have shared with the members of this board some history, current regulations on keeping emotional support animals and ADA laws, nearby town structures for fowl livestock, as well as some other vital information specific to this unique case. Batavia and Naperville have guidelines about the proximity to neighbors and streets that work for them and some of what they state could possibly be applied to the village of Montgomery, specifically the setback minimum distances. I can only assume that the city of Batavia arrived at those distances 30 feet from any adjacent occupied residential structure and 150 feet from all streets out of consideration for their other taxpaying citizens as well as safety of the animals and to minimize sanitation concerns. The setback in Naperville is uh, about 200 feet for livestock. Having worked roughly half of my professional career training and teaching individuals with developmental disabilities as a qualified mental health professional and the other half as an administrative assistant and permitting engineer, I feel I have a unique perspective about this situation. I grew up on a 240-acre farm with pigs, chickens, geese, and cattle, along with spending a lot of time at my grandparents' home that had sheep and chickens. I'm not against emotional support animals and have seen firsthand the positive impact taking care of a pet can have on a person's well-being. I'm just saying there needs to be a balance between raising animals of any kind in a way that is considerate to the people who live around them and the needs of such animals especially housing close to 20 chickens or more in a very small area. Does having a diagnosis which requires an emotional support animal make a resident exempt from current code enforcement? Can't the village require that a prescribed emotional support animal fall within current guidelines to safeguard the health, sanitation, safety, and consideration of others? If not, what will happen when a neighbor becomes ill as a direct result of unsanctioned animals? I have family and friends that are not allowed to be near this backyard farm because of medical conditions that fall into the CDC's list of being immunocompromised and the close proximity to my property. This includes persons under five, over 65, those receiving chemotherapy and have other chronic illnesses, I mean, just to name a few. I've had cancer. I've gone through radiation therapy. When I was doing so, I had to be away from everyone for a week at a time. And I just don't think that I should have to subject myself to staying inside my own home if that were to come back. It's my understanding that keeping fowl in your backyard is currently not allowed in the village of Montgomery for any reason. Whether these animals are prescribed by an organization or a doctor, it is still up to the governing body of the local municipality to choose whether or not they will be allowed. I've already found chicken feathers in my grill. The Foxmore subdivision was clearly not built with lot sizes ideal for housing livestock or fowl. Very few properties are able to provide the required setback distances outlined by other municipalities. The apparent priority here was given to produce a maximum amount of homes and tax revenue, 
with a minimum yard size. I'm not against all areas of Montgomery being allowed to house fowl for one reason or another. I'm saying that in the Foxmoor subdivision and others like it, they don't seem to be the right environment. It is the responsibility of our elected officials to uphold the rights of all citizens, not just one. The current city ordinances were written for a reason. Neither myself nor my family are against having a non-traditional pet, especially if it is being prescribed for a legitimate condition or reason. What I am asking, how can the current ordinances be bent, broken, or disregarded in the favor of a single citizen without regard for any other? I'm in favor of the creation of permitting regulations, setback minimum distances, proper coop construction guidelines, proper livestock fencing, and sanitation regulations for the disposal of contaminated waste. A few suggestions I have are guidelines making the applicant liable financially through a paid permitting and inspection process, perhaps including an addendum for fence height restrictions between adjoining lots to include the addition of two feet to four feet above the already, already four feet of any existing fence or constructing a new six to eight foot fence surrounding the applicant's property. If no higher fencing will be permitted, Naperville's Ordinance 10-4-6, paragraph 3.6, calls for a six-foot non-deciduous plantings around the perimeter of the lot or the pen. I'm concerned about the things I see from my backyard and feel that this severely impacts my resale value of the adjacent properties. It's currently an eyesore. I welcome anyone from the board to trade spaces with my family for a day to form your own opinion. No buildings constructed or pens should exist within any easement area, utility, drainage, or otherwise. Speaking of drainage, special consideration should also be taken regarding any contaminated waste that may enter the sanitary or storm sewer systems. Clear limits on the quantity of, of animals. I doubt the current number of fowl was inferred. Clear direction regarding the types of, owl, of animals. I mean, I'm sure that uh, alligators are not okay. Should these animals' pets have the right to be housed indoors? In Naperville and Batavia, the coops, pen areas, and sanitary conditions are subject to inspection at any time. The current clear violations of existing municipal and county codes should not be overlooked or ignored pending this review process. To quote one of my favorite movies, logic clearly dictates that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. The precedent set here can lead to a slippery slope. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak. To save some searching time, I'd like to give you a quick reference material on many Illinois regulations pertaining to backyard fowl. I have copies that I can give to each member of the board. Thank you, That's I appreciate it. it. Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Brittany Velotti, and I am the owner of the home that everyone is here um, to discuss. My husband is a veteran, and he is 100% disabled rated by the Department of Veteran Affairs. My husband has endured a lot of physical and emotional and mental pain. He is going to be suffering for the rest of his life, and he is 25 years old. So when he found something that finally gave him something to look forward to and to be excited about. We have two toddlers, so every single day is stressful on top of being in pain and having migraines every day. And these, I have no long-winded speech and references. I, I had no idea about this meeting or that they were even going to the city. But I would really like to know what, um, what noise they make, what smell they have. Any member of this board is welcome to come to my house right now and walk through the coop and realize it's, it, there's nothing wrong with it. The, it is the neighbor's vendetta against my family that has brought the issue and I personally just want to 
bring up the point that my chickens are in a Rubbermaid shed, and those are permitted by Montgomery with no permits needed. They, it has fencing around it. It is completely fenced in. They do not get out, ever. They are never around, out anywhere. When we clean their coop, we immediately bag everything and it gets shoveled into a black garbage bag and put into the garbage. Um, I did one day have two bags tied up outside that, because I wasn't able to bring it in and my husband, you know, he wasn't home. So yes, I will admit my fault on that one, um, but I have addressed it with uh, the neighbor across the street from me. He has a direct view from his home straight to the property, straight to where my chickens are housed. And he had no idea that they were there. And this was after they were there for about three weeks. I know that it's unconventional and it's something different and not what everybody would think would be a normal support animal. But to see the smile that it puts on his face, our dog doesn't do that. And it, they give him something more than just, you know, eggs. They don't even give him eggs. So I just hope, I know this isn't a vote, and I hope that you guys realize that these are family members that they're trying to get rid of. These, I have two, you know, like I said, two toddlers, and he was talking about immunocompromised. I have a two-year-old, or a one-and-a-half-year-old and a, a four-year-old, not even four-year-old, and they have both had no issues. They know that um, you wash your hands after you deal with them, and that's pretty much it. We wear masks when we clean everything out. We keep the doors closed so no dust comes out. I mean, if a feather blew anywhere, it's no different than any dog hair that could blow in someone's yard and or a bird that flew by and dropped a feather. And I apologize, and I'll try and maintain you know, a closer eye on that, but I feel like they have not impacted anybody as much as everybody is leading you to believe because they don't make any noise. We have no roosters. I made sure of that because I don't want the noise either. My chickens are kept clean and sanitary because I want them to be in a habitable home. I don't want them to have to suffer for it. So I hope you all realize that and I apologize <coughs> for every issue and all the time you've had to spend on this issue and um, I hope that you guys see that my husband does deserve to have his support animal that was prescribed by a uh, therapist through the Department of Veterans. So I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Any other member of the public wishing to address the board on this or any topic? Good evening. I spoke in front of you two weeks ago regarding my concern for chickens in my neighbor's yard. Since then, more information has come to light and my concern has increased dramatically. Starting where my research has shown me is the beginning, let us review the law. I have concern about section 4-1. Definitions of the Montgomery Code of Ordinances states that public nuisances include any animal, snake, reptile, lizard, rodent, not expressly permitted to be kept, owned, or harbored in the village of, of Montgomery. Any chicken, duck, goose, or turkey to run at large on any property not properly zoned. The first infraction is that 2904 Shetland Lane is zoned residential. They knew it and blatantly chose to disregard the city's rules. March 23rd, our neighbor posts on social media, we did something ridiculous today. She goes on to post a picture of three chicks and named them. Further in the post, someone asks her if they're legal in her area, to which she, res she responds, not illegal, but against the city ordinance, but husband found a loophole. I'm going to build the interior of a shed up for a coop for them when they get big enough, six weeks. The conversation goes on to say, some areas are so strict and charge fines and the residents respond with, we back a farm too, so only my neighbors would know. I'll bribe them with eggs. 
I have concern about section 4.4 of Montgomery Code of Ordinance stating the limit on number of animals. There shall be a limit, limit, a maximum limitation per household of four domestic animals, not to exceed two dogs or two cats or two of any one species. Any animal used as a bona fide service animal shall not be counted in determining the numbers of the animals in a household, and so on. Bona fide service animal. The US Department of Justice and the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, specifically state that service animals are defined as dogs that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. Examples of such work or tasks include guiding people who are blind, alerting people who are deaf, pulling a wheelchair, alerting and protecting a person who is having a seizure, reminding a person with a mental illness to take prescribed medications, calming a person with PTSD during an anxiety attack, or performing other duties. I continue to quote, the work or task a dog has been trained to provide must be directly related to the person's disability. Dogs whose sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support do not qualify as service animals under the ADA. The residence at 2904 Shetland Lane currently has one dog, one bunny, and 53 chicken. I know, where did I find this? The blessing of social media. Six weeks ago, our neighbor posted on social media that, and I quote, I have 23 chicks. Two weeks after that, there was another post, and I quote, I have 30 eggs incubating. Laughing face, I'm in over my head. The conversation proceeds to astonishment that it is, in fact, a lot of eggs, to which I'll quote the response for you. I had 36, but it's day nine, and six never developed. They were from a great friend, and so on. 23 and 30, that's 53 chickens, folks. By far superseding the limit of four animals per household and two of any species. In fact, I'm not shy to call this hoarding chicken, and they may consider seeking help for such. I have a concern about section 4-8A of Montgomery Code states that it shall be unlawful for any person to permit any chicken, duck, goose, or turkey to run at large on any property not properly zoned. The resident stated five weeks ago on social media that, and I quote, my girls were trained to stay by the coop. This is the third violation of the city's ordinances. I have a concern about section 4-14, raising boarding to comply with zoning. No one shall raise animals or fowl for sale within the village limits unless properly zoned, nor keep for profit any kennel for the boarding of animals unless properly zoned. The first attempt for the residents to sell was at the beginning of May on the Sugar Grove, Elburn, Yorkville area sales Facebook group, where they posted pictures of their chickens attempting to rehome boys, but also stated, I also have a few Bantman Cotchin pullets I'm trying to sell. I need to thin out the flock, $4 a Bantman pullet. The second attempt was on May 19th on the King County Swap, Buy, Sell, Farm Stuff and Animals, where they posted that for $8 in Montgomery, Illinois, they had three Golden Comet hens. I'm trying to thin out my flock, unquote. This is the fourth ordinance that they have broken on two separate occasions. The fifth ordinance that they are not in compliance with that I have concern about is section 4-15, farm animals prohibited, exception for agricultural zones. Farm animals which shall include but not be limited to horses, cattle, swine, and fowl shall not be harbored in the village except on property zoned agricultural. I don't think there's any confusion that this is in fact a residential zone with real fowl and chicken. I have a concern about the violation of section 4-16 excretion removal that is truly appalling. It states the owner of every animal shall be responsible for immediate removal and sanitary disp disposition of any excretion deposited by his animal anywhere in the village. The last time I spoke in front of you, it was mostly on concern for health, which has not been dis diminished. Let's talk about Friday, May 18th of 2018. For the first time since I returned home from vacation on May 9th, 2904 Shetland Lane decided to clean their coop. This resulted in the black garbage bags of feces sitting around their yard, open for wind, rain, or critters to tear into as a feast. They were not removed until the city requested they had been. Chicken feces is dangerous to the immediate community's health because if it touches our items, we could contract salmonella. If spores enter the air, histoplasmosis is an infection caused by breathing in said spores that according to mayoclinic.org and the American Lung Association is most commonly transmitted when these spores become airborne often during cleanup. 53 chickens worth of fecal matter. Soil contaminated by bird droppings can also transmit this illness, but we can discuss soil later. 
This can be life-threatening illness to anyone with a weakened immune system, like my daughter who recently underwent surgery, or even more so, our three-year-old nephew who plays at our home frequently. He undergoes treatment for cancer every six weeks and has since he was four months old. I think we've gone through enough of the violations of the city's code to know this should most definitely not be happening, but it is. And at the last meeting, it was stated that it may be the exception to the rule because a doctor wrote a letter stating a need for six service chickens and that this letter was from the VA. At the time, I handed Director Young a page from social media where the resident stated it was for her, not for her husband, who is retired Marine. Ever since this has begun, every post, comment, and picture has been about her needing the chicken and her problems and how she is benefiting from the chickens. This is a complete mis misrepresentation of the letter in question. Has the city done their due diligence? As previously stated, these chicken cannot legally be service chicken. So let's look at an emotional support chicken. Did you know that for $59, you too can answer a questionnaire online through tens of different companies, have it reviewed by a mental health professional, and receive your emotional support animal certificate? It's that easy. But those certificates don't allow them above city, state, or federal law without the law's consent. Does the village of Montgomery want to make an exception to the rule for this one residence? Do you want to put individual expression over communal well-being? Wait, why would I say individual expression? Well, for starters, they are building a mansion, as they state on April 26th, for their 53 chickens. That is a lot of emotional support. Or reporting of animals or sale of animals, I guess it depends on the day as what their purpose is. On April 16th, someone online asked, when buying your chickens, what were you looking for? A, a bird that lays an egg, B, show quality, C, small cute pet, D, unusual rare bird. Wondering if most people know and care about APA standards. To which she replied, A, which is laying eggs, not the cute small pet. Or how about on May 6th, when they publicly state their true intent? The time has come and decision has been made that since we lack a lot of the family we moved home for, we're picking up and moving out of Illinois. Staying close enough to be a mom through the holidays, we can have so much more for so much less elsewhere, and we want a life of chickens, hunting, and no neighborhood kids kicking balls into our car and coming into our garage. Within a year, we will be uprooting again. Call us crazy, we are. In the conversation of that same post, it is stated, we need to find our home. He wants to hunt and I want gardens and chickens free ranging, raising meat birds to process for my family, barn cat to kill off mice, and Milo not being an inside my house dog, and so on. Clearly, they don't like our area and they currently don't respect their neighbors. In fact, when an online forum asks what people do when their neighbors are upset about their chickens, 2904 Shetland Lane responded with, and I quote, Tell them to piss up a rope and mind their own business. Due diligence. Is this intention honest and forthcoming? Is this letter from a doctor legitimate? Is the doctor an actual mental health care professional licensed in the state of Illinois? If you're answering yes, let me share my concerns for what needs to be considered when making an exception to the rule, one that will be long lasting for years to come and hard to revoke later. The village of Montgomery should require all departments to cohesively determine the most responsible regulations for such allowance, including but not limited to zoning, building, health, and code enforcement. If any animal is to be considered a support animal, superseding the laws of our city, we need to ask, is there a verifiable disability, not just companionship? Does the mental impairment substantially limit one or more major life activities? Does a support animal, animal alleviate one or more identified symptoms or effects of a person's disability? If no to any of these questions, the city should not change or make exceptions to the law. The city should dampen the thrill of the support animal chat trend. This isn't about education or sustainable living. This is about therapy. Is there training for animal or owner? Do you see a veterinarian every six months to two years? Are they receiving the proper vaccinations, living conditions, and who from the city will be responsible for maintaining and checking on such regulations? Using chickens as an example, will the city require owners to only use hatcheries that are participating in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's poultry improvement plans to reduce the risk of salmonella? Feel free to educate yourselves with the CDC statistics on the salmonella outbreak of 2017 from backyard chickens. Are they teaching owners the safest way to remove waste, proper living conditions for outdoor animals and such? 
What happens to the soil in the area of this residential chicken coop? It's certainly contaminated. How deep and who's responsible for the testing? If they move, who replaces that contaminated soil? And how deep? One foot, three, five feet? Is there a disclosure to the next owner that the land was allowed and used for such animals? And shouldn't we as neighbors have a little say in if we want to look at these outdoor enclosures? Some plans and pictures of, should plans and pictures of said animal enclosures be submitted for permits and approval? Not one of you would enjoy the scene from our homes right now. And as of this morning, our lawyer let us know our property is being taxed as though our home is valued higher than any home that has sold in our neighborhood recently. But I will be surprised if the appraisal will find our view to be worthy of the same value. I will be sending you a copy of my concerns as well as all my supporting documents this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Okay. And we'll be discussing this um, under item seven later. Okay. You know what? If it's to re rebut what they're saying, I kind of have to keep us to the... I will make it very short and sweet. If I let you do it, then I have to let her do it. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. But they got to go twice. Why can't I defend my... <laughs> Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? Good evening. How are you all doing? Good, how are you? I saw your faces a few weeks ago when we were uh, discussing the whole um, car wash. So I'm back here again tonight um, to speak in favor of the village board revisiting, revisiting its current municipal code surrounding backyard hens in Montgomery. I'm not here to express an opinion one way or the other about the alleged emotional support chickens, um, but instead take a couple minutes to dispel some myths that I've heard during previous discussions and this evening. Um, I initially became interested in poultry since my daughter has been a Kendall County 4-H'er for the past three years. She's been fortunate enough to be part of the poultry spin club through 4-H and has um, that allowed her to show chickens last year at the fair. Um, the knowledge that my daughter has gained, in my opinion, far outweighs any risks I know of. What I'm speaking about today, in my opinion, is calculated risk. Every time you do anything in life, get in a car, ride a bike, or sadly, even attend a school here in America, you're at risk sometimes deadly risk, okay? I listened to the recordings in opposition to backyard hens and would like to offer my opinion supported by documented facts from the Center for Disease Control website. Um, I know one of the risks was spores entering the air. The fact is that the fungus responsible, Histoplasma capsulatum, grows in nitrogen-rich soils all throughout the world. In the U.S., it's most prevalent in central and eastern states along the Ohio, Mississippi, and St. Lawrence rivers. It can be carried on wings, feet, beaks of birds, but did you know that the roosts of red-winged blackbirds, grackles, starlings, pigeons, cowbirds, all which are native here in the surrounding area in Illinois, um, can carry and contain this fungus? Um, does the risk of toxoplasmosis then to pregnant women mean we should ban cats? Should we take measures to ban dogs because they can tran transmit numerous diseases to humans such as roundworms, tapeworms, giardia, cryptosporidiosis, Lyme disease, just to name a few? I know of at least a few members in this audience who are breaking the current code in regards to how many dogs they have in their home. <laughs> so, you know, it's happening all around Montgomery. I think that Part of what the conversation is, is you know neighbors are becoming disgruntled. So again, I'm not here to offer my opinion about what we should do about this particular situation, but instead say, hey village, let's take a look at what's happening all around in our communities, um, such as Oswego, Sugar Grove, Naperville, Batavia, <coughs> St. Charles, you know, just to name a few of the local ones, um, and what they're doing about their policy on backyard chickens. Um, Sorry, I lost my place. Um, and then, or perhaps maybe we should look at banning Walmart because on May 18th this year, it and Food Lion had to recall 206 million eggs with salmonella contamination. The CDC website cites that each year, roughly one in six Americans or 48 million people get sick with foodborne illness. Since 2000, yes, in 18 years, the number of salmonella outbreaks nationwide due to backyard poultry is 70, with a total of 4,937 people sick. So humor me for a moment as I extrapolate those numbers. Backyard poultry represents 0.00057% of foodborne illness in America over the last 18 years. 
Um, I'd like to add that the average weight, weight of a red-tailed hawk is 2.4 pounds, not nearly the same size as a 20-pound child, so I'm not sure how that would happen. Um, I appreciate all animals. I appreciate the opportunity for my children to have a deeper understanding of life cycles, where food comes from, demonstrate responsibility, count and sort eggs, have a closer connection to life. You know, as I mentioned earlier, numerous communities have rewritten their municipal code. Um, and even more distant communities such as Wayne, Oak Brook, Burr Ridge, Downers Grove, Warrenville allow them. Although I do not know and have not personally seen the residence coop in question, nor do I know the exact number of chickens, it seems from hearsay that there's a lot of misinformation out there. I think it's time for the community to learn about the benefits of keeping backyard hens. Hens are social in nature, thrive best in community, provide food for families, allow our children immeasurable, immeasurable educational opportunities. If the village board rethinks their position on backyard poultry, the village could increase revenue by mandating permits for hens and coops, set codes similar to surrounding communities, and can place a reasonable number limit with guidelines on setback and dedicated space. Thank you for your time and consideration. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Liliana Kesbarian, and these are my friends and fellow 4 -Hers. Um We all love chickens and have learned so much about them. I did poultry spin club in the winter and spring. I learned about the bones, the parts of the chicken, the different types of combs and waddles, and the breeds, and much more. It was so fun that I even got to make a poster about the oil gland on the chicken. The oil gland is using, used for preening, which is when they rub their beaks on their oil gland and rub it all over their feathers to keep them in good condition. My friend Lindsay even started a petition at her school to get signatures about why she should keep chickens in Montgomery. I really hope we can begin to keep uh, chickens because to some of us, they are not only our pets, they are family. And to think about it, how would you feel if one of your family members was banned forever? Plus, you even get fresh eggs and they keep you company. That's why I think you should be able to keep chickens in Montgomery. Thank you for listening. Awesome, thank you. Awesome, thank you, appreciate Thanks. it. I'm not here for chickens. <laughs> Cows. Hi, my name is Mary Wilson. I live in Lakewood Creek West, and I am here. I do see that it's on there. I'm hoping it says a water contract to Conley Excavating, so I'm hoping that it's going to be going that way. I just wanted to make sure that everyone still understood that we are definitely very worried about the um, flooding that happens in that Comet area. We had significant rain last week. I ended up staying home for the day instead of going to work to watch it. It was very difficult to see the prairie at first because the grasses were so tall there currently. But then it did, unfortunately. The flooding didn't flood anyone's house this time. No one, I guess Andrea received some water in her basement. But other than that, we didn't this time. It was terrifying last time when we got water. We did have to sandbag last fall. My concern now is that with Alberto already coming in and the water we're getting tomorrow, the water we got last week, we are reaching a threshold of the water table is so high that any water that's gonna happen for the rest of the summer, if we have a wet, humid summer, is going to continue to come into our homes and in the back there. And I'm also worried about the standing water that's happening in what's becoming almost a marshy area under those power lines because of that, because it's not, the correct amount of drainage that was initially installed. And so I'm imploring the board and really hoping that it gets passed today that we can have the correct amount of drainage so that those homes are not continuously affected with flooding and therefore unable to finish basements or if they have finished basements, have to rip them out in order to deal with that problem currently. Thanks so much. Awesome, thank you. And I have no reason to believe that the, that the item will not go uh, is planned today and our engineer will update us on the timeline as to construction hopefully when we get Fantastic. there. Fantastic. Yeah, that water is getting really, yeah. I sent my kids out there to play and they said it was definitely <laughs> marshy when they went on the recon that I sent them on. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? All right. With that, we'll move on to uh, the, the rest of the meeting here. We have uh, the consent agenda, I'll read the items and entertain a motion for approval. Minutes of the village board meeting of May 14th, executive session minutes of May 14th, accounts payable uh, for FY18 through May 24th, accounts payable for FY19 through May 24th, uh, appointment by the village president of Haley Brzaska of 3122 Fairfield Way to the Historic Preservation Commission, 
Uh, waiver of uh, temporary liquor license fee for, um, for Montgomery Fest, that's for the Montgomery Foundation. And uh, G is waiver of temporary liquor license fee for beers, bands, and, and barns, excuse me. And the final item is ordinance 1799 authorizing the purchase of real property at 1335 Amber Drive. This is second reading. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the roll. Trustee Youngerman. Yay. Trustee Marisek. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. And Trustee Heinz. Yay. All right, and that carries 5 0. Thank you. Item for separate action this evening, we have award of a contract to Conley Excavating uh, for the Lakewood Creek West ComEd Storm Sewer Improvements in the amount of $140,649.50. And with that, I'll ask Engineer Wallers for an update. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just to give a quick update, we had seven bidders uh, that responded to our request for, for bids. Um, the low bidder was Conley Excavating. They have done work in the village in the past. Uh, and done quite a good job for us. You may recall they worked in Boulder Hill on the water main project. Um, the uh, engineer's estimate was $166,680. Um, so it's about 15% below budget. We are recommending approval of that contract. And I'd also like to ask the board to consider um, authorizing the mayor to sign the lease agreement from Common Commonwealth Edison um, subject to village attorney review uh, and issuing the notice to proceed once that lease is executed so that we could start at the earliest possible time. It's not certain when we'll receive the lease agreement from ComEd, but they've indicated to us that it would be the first part of June. And I thought if we got it prior to the next board meeting, we'd be able to start just that much sooner. So. Um, Again, we recommend approval of award to Conley in the amount of $140,649.50 with the provision that the mayor be allowed to authorize or uh, execute the lease agreement subject to attorney approval and issue a notice to proceed. For the residents here, could you kind of go through, give us a, a couple minutes of exactly what this is, where the lines are going to be going, what we're going to be doing? Sure, so we have, uh, there's a couple of components to the project. Um, the first component is we've uh, installed a second um, release pipe from the existing detention basin so that we can move water through the detention basin uh, quicker. Uh, the second and probably the more important element is we will be installing a drain tile along the west um, side of the uh, Commonwealth Edison uh, um, easement and that uh, drain tile will be perforated so that it can collect water and help draw down the, um, the groundwater but also it'll have surface inlets that'll accept water so that standing water should be mostly be able to be eliminated. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the project so two elements to it. One question, is the drain tile on the east or west side of that bike path? It'll be on the east side of the bike path but on the uh, west side of the west side of the, and, okay. um, property. So we tried to get it as close as we could. We are also um, uh, have um, left space for a future storm sewer improvement depending on uh, what happens with the state improvements on 47. So this is, I would say, phase one of the project. What is the, the diameter of the perforated drain tile? You got I, I know. I, I don't remember. Uh, I have to get back to you on that. It, it's not a huge tile, but it's it's either 12 or 18 inch, I believe, diameter. The existing drainage that we've got now, that it is the catch basins behind the homeowners' houses, that will stay in place and will continue to work. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm amazed I got him on a question. That's so. Awesome. Do you know the size of those catch basins? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I do appreciate it. Any other questions on the? Yeah, how, uh, or I'm glad you got it under your budget amount, and I'm glad we got seven people to bid on it, which means it's a, it's a good price. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Uh, construction. So assuming we get okay. ComEd squared away, which frankly we really don't control that or really have any say in when they'll give us the lease. But when they do, how long do you, will construction take? 
We'll get a detailed schedule from okay. the contractor. Uh, we've allowed a, a certain period of time for him to do the construction, but typically they won't use all that time. But in order to attract the bids that we wanted, we've allowed for 60 days for construction. I guess you. And it would be this, hopefully, I mean, this construction season. Well, definitely. Depending yeah. on what comment says. And I'd like to, again, we'd like to, we'll issue, if it's a, awarded, we'll issue notice of award tomorrow to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as soon as we get the lease agreement, we'll issue notice to proceed. I got you. And if we need to put a little pressure on ComEd to speed that up, I'm certainly willing that to do that. That would not hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So moved with the so provision. Perfect. Um, that uh, Engineer Wallers is mentioned as far as the lease agreement with ComEd. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Call roll. Trustee Youngerman? Yes. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. And Trustee Heinz? Okay. Carries 5 0. Thank you, Pete. Item B this evening is a temporary liquor license for the Oswego Chamber of Commerce. I can handle this. Okay. Uh, this one's on for separate action because this is the first time this has come before you. So the president of the chamber is here if you have questions. As you can see, this is their second annual event. Last year they held it in Yorkville. This year they're looking to hold it at Dixon Merce Farms. And she has said in a letter going forward they'd like to, to hold it there. So if you have any questions, I said Angie is here. Yeah. Welcome to the village of Montgomery. Thank you for picking uh, a venue in Montgomery. And it's a great venue. I mean, it really is a fantastic site to it host is, an event. It is. Like a motion to approve temporary liquor license for the Oswego Chamber. Perfect. I'll second. Call the roll. Trustee Marisak? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Hines? Yay. And Trustee Youngerman? Yes. That carries 5 0. Thank you. All right, item C is Ordinance 1813, amending the village code regarding liquor licenses and outdoor dining. Uh, we've put this on for a waiver of first and passage on the second due to the uh, summer is upon us, but the staff have anything additional to add on this? I know we talked about this at the last meeting to make these modifications. Somebody want to summarize or I mean, uh, any questions from the board? Yeah, I mean, if we just tried to put into, uh, into the ordinance what the board had agreed to last time, so outdoor music, uh, pre-recorded music is allowed. Uh, it adds their category, I think, like class B, to now allowed for outside dining. I think that's... And I did... I was at Niners. They do have outdoor music, so. I think it was one of those that no one realizes yeah. that mm -hmm. because this isn't Footloose. <clears throat> think about it. All right. <laughs> Before we get off the rails here, is there a motion? Motion to approve Ordinance 1813, amending the village code for liquor licenses, outdoor din and dining. Second. Trustee Marisek? Yes. Trustee Sperling? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Heights? Yay. And Trustee Youngerman. Yay. But be no that carries 5 0. Thank you. Item D is a resolution 2018 010 authorizing a stationary food vendor license. Uh, this is time to drive auto. Uh, as you recall, these are required to come before the board for approval. With that I'll turn it over to Director, Attorney, whoever, Who wants it? whoever wants it, for a summary on the item. It, you can this is a request for um, temporary food vendor or yeah, temporary food vendor um, at auto, um, I'm sorry, time to drive auto on Montgomery Road, similar to the request that we've had on, on Douglas Road for um, the, um, I can't remember the name of it now, the beef operation. Barbecue, pigs and Barbecue heat. beef, pigs and heat, mm -hmm. pigs and heat. And then there's a taco uh, uh, yeah. food vendor that's at the car wash on Montgomery Road, literally almost across the street from this current location. So this meets the regulations that have been put in place for um, temporary food vendors or stationary food vendors. So we recommend approval. Yep. And I do just want to note that the resolution itself um, does address all three because even though two of the ones previously had the license, they expire annually. So it, 
once we're granting this one, we went back and included the other two. So these are the three currently that are authorized within the village for this year. And one question that I had is, um, it's hard to tell from this map, but I mean, this is going to be available for <coughs> and hopefully public use? Yes. Is it, is it ba really buried inside this? It's right up front along oh, okay. Montgomery Road. They're, they would eliminate some of the spots that they have for used vehicles and put it in that location. I get you. I see but the that, X I think now. that's There's the a little Google box Maps pin. The next. Yeah. I think right. that's I was Google. looking at the pin, and I should have been yeah. looking at the big black box with the Correct. X in it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I have a quick question for Director Young. Wasn't there a different hot dog stand there at one point? I'm not aware of it. If there was, I, I was never aware of it. Or so. right in that area, because I was surprised that we only had the three when I saw the resolution, because that was my concern. I thought there was another one over there at some point. Is there one maybe on the Aurora side? That, it does get a little choppy be, there because yes. some of the properties are and in the that village. Could be, um, some are township. incorporated and some are in okay. Aurora. I think that's because I remember yeah. seeing one, but I, I think it's on the Aurora side. So that would be my only concern. I don't want to see an oversaturation of these types of permits. I, I'm okay with where we're at right now. There are all different types of food that are in the various food trucks or what do we call them, temporary food licenses. But I am a little bit concerned. Again, I just don't want to see us get too saturated and potentially be taking away business from restaurants at some point. I don't think these three are going to cause that. I'm just saying in the future, mm -hmm. I, I think we need to be uh, very cognizant of how many we have. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Motion to approve. Resolution 2018-010. Second. Thank you. Call the roll. Trustee Nersak. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. Trustee Hines. Yay. And Trustee Engelman. Yay. That carries 5 0. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Items to, uh, for discussion. We have chickens in residential subdivisions. Who would like to Director kick Young this one is going to start. The tag team on this, Laura, is going to take the first part regarding um, support animals, and then I'll talk about what the existing code is. <laughs> So as uh, Director Young mentioned, there's two questions. Um, one is regulations and whether or not the village wants to regulate backyard chickens generally. And then secondly, if not, um, how to deal with an emotional support animal request um, when it invokes the zoning ordinance or other uh, provisions of the village code. Um, there's one point of clarification that I did want to make tonight, um, which is this analysis and the framework that we're using is the Fair Housing Act. It's not the ADA. Um, the ADA applies to places of public accommodation and the laws that were cited are correct with regard um, to service animals being different from emotional support animals. But under the FHA and the amendments, um, there is no set definition and there's not the same stringent requirements um, for an emotional support animal as there is for a service animal. Um, and really, there isn't a whole lot um, of definition. Otherwise, there are certain parameters that need to be met with regard to an emotional support animal. Um, but the village is very limited in its ability to review um, the actual necessity of it. Um, there's requirements that the Act has for what a person must provide to support the fact that it's an emotional support animal, but it's not incumbent on the village to determine whether or not they believe that um, that assessment of the doctor is correct. As long as that medical documentation meets the requirements of the act, the village doesn't delve deeper into whether or not they believe that the doctor's assessment was correct or not. Um, so our job is to make sure the documentation is legitimate and that it's from um, a qualified provider, but not to determine whether or not the village believes that there's a medical necessity. Um, that being said, the crux of what the municipality uh, reviews in a case like this is um, if there's an accommodation that's been requested, in which case um, there has been, as we all mentioned tonight, and then secondly, whether or not that um, request can be reasonably accommodated. And the key in the review is the reasonableness. Um, there's been lots of mention of violations of Zillow uh, village zoning ordinances and other regulations. And what the Fair Housing Act requires is that the village review those ordinances on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's what that reasonable accommodation would be, is to whether or not in a particular instance 
that rule or regulation would not apply to a certain situation or individual. So that's what the law requires us. It doesn't require the village to change the ordinance, it doesn't require the village to necessarily grant um, the accommodation, but it does require the village to make that assessment as to whether or not a reasonable accommodation can be granted, and if so, then it sh there should be some accommodation made. And it's an exemption for that individual it's case. Individual so it's case Pandora's only. Box. It's case by case, um, and something that might be allowed on one site very well might not be allowed on another site, just depending on the facts and circumstances of that case. Lot so location size. Exactly. I mean, every okay. fact um, would matter very specifically. So you can't really make a blanket um, emotional support determination as to this is what we look at because each case, by the very virtue of it being a request for an accommodation, depends on the specifics that you can't um, make uniform like that. Um, so yes, and then just being able to factually support the determination. Um, there's a multitude of factors that can be reviewed. And then another thing worth noting is if an accommodation is granted, and again, it's not required, but it, the assessment is required if it, the determination as to whether or not it can be um, granted is required. And if that accommodation is granted, then that person still can have um, reasonable rules and regulations set forth to that circumstance. So it's not, you can do this, but nobody else can. You can still set, um, for the example, just using chickens, um, you, know, you could set restrictions as to what the containment must be and to what, um, you know, the setbacks must be in that particular case based on the property, based on all those um, other criteria. So those are certainly things that can be um, built into a reasonable accommodation because again, it's not just a um, open blanket approval for something, it's how to make that accommodation or if that accommodation is feasible, what could, um, what could make it feasible, I guess. Um, Yeah, and then um, the one last point worth noting is that again, the other provisions that aren't um, that that aren't changed um, or modified as part of this accommodation still are enforceable. So, if, um, for example, somebody wasn't cleaning up after the chicken, the code enforcement would still be able to enforce all other generally applicable rules and regulations in the village, or if any debris or anything was going on to adjacent properties. Um, any noise regulations, all of that would still be enforceable. It would just be whatever specific provisions of the zoning ordinance or of the village code that um, were granted as part of the accommodation would not be enforced, but anything else that would be generally applicable would be. Um, so with that being said, I know that's a lot of information. I'm happy to take questions. I have one. Is it incumbent upon the would-be petitioner to come to the village? Yes. As opposed to just ignoring village code completely and doing what they want? Yes, the petitioner would have to make it, the entire process gets triggered when a request is made um, for this type of accommodation. And, and that person would have to provide evidence okay. um, supporting whatever, the, if they were claiming it an emotional support or service reason, um, they would be, it would be incumbent on the petitioner to provide that documentation. And in this case, the, petition, the petitioner didn't do that, correct? Code enforcement was notified of a violation and right, that's how it started, and then they did. Then they did come then in. They did and make apply. the request okay. and bring the information. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question then about the the documentation that gets submitted to um, basically state that they are in need of a support animal, in terms of determining that it's legitimate. I mean, clearly there's privacy issue that issues there, but I mean. Are, how do we determine if it's legitimate? I mean, do we call the doctor and say, did you really issue this? I mean, is because I mean, anybody, and again, I'm not implying that you did, so please don't take it that way. But I mean, anybody could slap any letterhead on the top of something and make up or even steal a doctor's name and say, yeah, that's the doctor I see. So yeah. I guess the question is, how far can we go 
just to make sure that it is legitimate. Yep, and you're absolutely right. Um, there's some parameters that the act requires, but again, knowing whether or not something is authentic is another question, um, in which case I would suggest that the person making the petition to the village, um, just knowing that it might be a hurdle, mm -hmm. can cooperate with the village and grant approvals or authorizations for a doctor to call the village and verify um, if there was questions as to legitimacy. Again, it's a difficult situation to try to navigate. It depends right. you know, exactly on the facts, but that would be one way to um, verify because if the person is required requesting something and it is incumbent on them to make a showing that they need it, right. um, you know, hopefully that they are able to provide that additional information. And I would think they would be cooperative with that because if that's something that they Correct. really truly be in their need, interest. they would be willing to then say yes. You can call my doctor and, and but see that they're a real person. And that and would be that would be to um, identify the authenticity. Again, right. we're not evaluating right. the legitimacy Nothing of it any or um, health. Correct. Right. And okay. if somebody's going to falsify a doctor's note, they got bigger problems really than chickens. Right. Uh, but anyway, any rate, did you have stuff, Rich, that you wanted to sure. go over? Yes, I do. Thank you, Laura. Um, so rather than reiterate all of the different code sections that um, the current use is in violation of, the, the sections that were referenced in our code of ordinances by the one resident are absolutely correct. That's part of what I was going to discuss in terms of definitions, in terms of public nuisance, um, the limit on the number of uh, domestic animals, um, animals at large, um, the fact that agricultural zones are the only place that in our current code that would allow chickens, um, the husbandry portion, and um, mm -hmm. just the fact that the uh, Foxmoor subdivision is zoned R3, R4, and R5 PUD, which is obviously clearly not uh, agricultural. One of the things that I wanted to point out in this discussion, we felt that it was important to look at uh, what adjacent communities have done with regards to chickens in general, not specifically for support animals, but if the village uh, board was of a mind to look at regulations, we have a whole slew of new regulations that have been put into place in seven different communities. We surveyed 10 uh, neighboring communities, seven of which recently in the last couple of years have added uh, backyard chickens as a, uh, as a use. And in all these cases that they've allowed them, um, roosters are not allowed and the maximum number is eight and the uh, minimum number is four. Um, in this particular case for a support animal, and it's already been mentioned that the letter has come from the BA, specifically it talked about six chickens represented a flock, which would be considered the service animal, if you will, as six. So I think in any regards, if we look at uh, reasonable regulations in terms of the number, whether it's for across the board changes to our code or just this service animal request, I think based on the reports that we have of how many are out there, we've far exceeded what seems to be in a reasonable accommodation. Um, there are a number of regulations of various um, uh, texts that indicate, just as the other uh, resident had indicated in terms of Naperville, the setbacks for the coops themselves, the distance from streets. All of those regulations have already been set up in, in these seven communities that I speak of uh, with regards to chicken regulations. So if it was the desire of the board either to change it across the board in the zoning ordinance or to deal with region, reasonable accommodations for a service animal, I think that we can draft said ordinance to um, uh, the board satisfaction. So we're just looking for direction at this point in time. Okay. Any questions uh, from the board? Yeah, I have one. So we have two issues. We need to address this service animal issue, the emotional support animal issue is a separate issue from us reviewing the village code because this is a case by case basis. So we don't really need to talk about the village code in reference to the service animal, the support animal. We just need to address that first, and then if we choose to review the village code, we could do If so. we look at chickens, my only suggestion is we, we set certain parameters in terms of setbacks, the size of a pen, the location or distance from the right-of-way uh, adjacent residence. Those could all be incorporated into either, either and or the well, service animal request and any 
uh, change in terms of how we allow chickens or not. Right. So sure. you're, you're correct. There are two issues out there then. Yeah. Do you want to change the current regulations regarding the prohibition on chickens to allow them in some manner? And then secondly is the this Addressing individual case. So just for the ease of conversation tonight, because up until um, the resident spoke earlier, nobody is requesting this um, village-wide. And so at this point, let's, let's leave that on the side. You know, zoning ordinance changes allowing this. I think that's a good discussion that needs to happen, probably work itself uh, through our plan commission and, and with our um, um, ordinance project that we're working on with CMAP. Um, and that's something I think we need to look at. But let's talk about as it relates to this specific situation uh, tonight, if that's all right with the board. Denny? Yeah, I'm, I'm also, I know everybody uses this thing, but Naperville, Batavia, Oswego, North Aurora, all our trustees maybe have passed this, but just because they all jump in the Fox River off the bridge, we don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and the other thing is, if we ever need a filibuster, I want that lady to be our spokesman because she can really string it out. I thought she was going to do a sit-in for a while or she just... I know. It. I'm just kidding. Kept it was actually very well put together. I really do appreciate yes, it. Yes, it was. Um, and the other lady, then the 4-H daughters, uh, I don't know if she belongs to any 4-H as far as out in the farm or wherever, like Newark does, Merce Farm, uh, and she said her kids are getting petitions together. That's something that we in the past, in the last not 16 years I've been on here, petitions don't mean a lot because you can take a petition in the stands here and everybody there because they're sitting next to you is gonna sign it. It doesn't mean anything to them, they're just gonna sign it rather than say no. So to us, petitions haven't in the past meant anything. Um, they, I'm glad they're learning something on that. Uh, I guess I'm starting with, she knew it was against the rules. And we've had people do that before and then try to slide it by. And, and from there, she should have never went online, which I've always said is a problem because then she's bringing up how she's getting around it. And to me, that is just, now she's selling animals, I, I just, I can see one or two or even six, but when you're looking at 40 chickens, I mean, my mother lived on a farm, grew up on a farm, and she had a pet pig, but my grandma never let that pet pig in the house. And she also had chickens, but it was certain rules, and it was a big farm. Uh, my grandpa, when he got older, got, got me four banny roosters for my kids, and that was fine, because he was still on a farm. But to this end, when you're living next to somebody, and I'm sure these other towns are making these rules, and we've got some areas that are rural where a person could put six chickens and nobody would even care. But in some of the lots over there are not real big. And when you've got six chickens living next to you, I just, I'm, I'm just not sure <clears throat> that it's gonna work. Um, the one thing I, I did have is I had a, in my special needs kids, I had a little kid that bought, mother bought some chickens. Thought it'd be a great thing for Easter. Whole bunch of little ones. And she was gonna put them in her backyard in Aurora. Aurora says no, but there, the neighbors didn't care. They all thought they were gonna get eggs. And I met her at Farm and Fleet. And I said, what are you doing with this big 50, you know, 50 uh, pound bag of chicken food. And, and these, little, these are little chicks. And she says, oh, we're, we're gonna start feeding them. And I go, do you know how much it's gonna cost you in the end? Mm -hmm. No, it's pretty expensive. Then the kid went back and told all the teachers, because he seen me at Farm and Fleet, that I had chickens. So I had to put that down real quick. It just got to be a mess. But in the end, three weeks later, I asked her how the chickens were and she said, and I told her, you have to have a good fence around it and all that. And, and as she mentioned, they can't get out, but animals can get in. And the raccoons and the foxes killed almost all the chickens. And they're right, not in an area where you would think there'd be predators. And there's predators all over. So I, I can't see having 40 of them running around, unless you keep them in your house. But they're not the cleanest animals, I know that. I, I just can't. 
I don't know. I, I just can't see changing our rule for anything. I mean, if you want to live on a farm, you want chickens, go buy a house on a farm. I mean, you had all kinds of choices, and they knew the rules when we came in here, and it's not one of these, let's get around this somehow. I mean, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. but, but that's what they were trying to do. Well, yeah. It, it's yeah. Well, and this ain't the first time people have come and done this, not just with chicken, but with other things, where they know the rules, and they go, I'm going to break the rules until somebody catches me. And to me, that's, I just don't like that. Yeah. And I'm fine airing the, I guess, frustration in that. Um, but regardless of that, we still, and kind of to summarize, I think, is um, we're required by the Fair Housing Act to investigate mm -hmm. making some accommodation, getting all the facts and having staff administratively, without changing our ordinances, look at this to see if this is something that, that we can accommodate without, and my biggest concern is, uh, with every issue that we talk about is the use and enjoyment of your property shouldn't impact the use and enjoyment of your next door neighbor. Uh, and if we can find a way to do that, and I think that's what staff would be looking to see if we can make a reasonable accommodation uh, to where the village would would uh, allow this to continue under some, some circumstances. So I think, I guess with, th with saying that, it would be, you know, our direction, or at least my direction to staff to say, you know, Move forward with this with this process um, administratively to see what kind of accommodations that you can propose and come to. Um, but at this time, it's not something that we would be looking to change our ordinance to codify to say if you meet these, you know, criteria, you get this, you get to have this. Is that? Yeah, and again, um, just to be clear, that if some sort of accommodation did end up being granted and it did pose to be a problem that was violating other provisions of the code, so for example, if you allowed chickens but they continued to do things and they <coughs> were posing those health hazards and they were going on to adjacent properties, that would all be things that then can be enforced. Um, again, it's just, it would just be changing the one particular provision, but it doesn't take away the village's power to enforce the other provisions that weren't modified as part of the accommodation. Um, I got a couple of things here. As far as talking about the special use animals and that, I think we're correct. It should go pl through plan commission and come to us. But on here individually, I've read through all of these, Chad, like I said I would. And based upon the violator's own words, I don't see it. She, she stood up here and mentioned that it was due to her husband. There's nothing on here, based upon her own words, that states that it's helping her husband or anything. They state that they want to live on a farm. They, they state that they back up to a farm. They state that they're trying to sell chickens. This is a business now. No, you had a chance to talk, ma'am. I understand, Chad, being a cancer survivor myself, I understand the neutropenic precautions that you've got to go through when you're going through chemotherapy. My dad was raised on a farm. I've been around chickens. I understand Denny's right. They're not the cleanest animal that there is. But based upon the violator's own words, absolutely not. You mean absolutely not? We would not? It, it, she supposedly has a letter that says you can have six, but she has 53. How is that not total disregard of, of ordinances, total disregard for your neighbor, total disregard for any, everything? Yeah. And that may be, I'm not saying, I'm, I don't think we're, I don't think it's really a coming upon us tonight to litigate the actual amount or the, or the, um, Accommodations that that we might make as staff, uh, you know, our staff with them, um, but I, I can't I can't say based on the information that I have whether or not they have six or fifty. But I see I, I get your point. I get what you're what you're saying. I think it's incumbent upon us tonight to direct staff to see if they can come to some reasonable accommodations based on this letter and verify the letter. Yes, um, well, and that's what we're required to do. It sounds like. Correct. My question would be. Did the letter come in the name of the husband, that the husband needs the, su excuse me, the uh, support animal, or did it come in the name of 
the lady, Brittany, I'm sorry, I don't remember your last name. Um, did it come in Brittany's name saying that she needs the support animal? Because again, uh, Facebook is public, so we all saw it. And Chad, I, I read through everything as well, and I appreciate what you sent us. And to me, it doesn't seem that um, the chickens are actually serving as support animals or emotional support animals based on what has been posted. To me, and again, just my opinion, it, to me, it appears that she's just strictly raising chickens at this point. So my question, and I'm questioning whether there is a reason to have an accommodation because, again, whose name did the letter come in saying it, that they needed the accommodation? And uh, when Brittany was here speaking, and she did talk about her husband and that um, he was the one that needed it, but I wrote down at the end, you called them my chickens several times. So I'm questioning who, who is it for? And the use of, there was the use of the word throughout this thread, we found a loophole. Absolutely, yes. The, the direct indication of we found a loophole. Now again, I see the attorney giving me the eye that my wife is the only one that ever has used that with me. Um, <laughs> but very clearly, there's a legalese there, and we can't really debate that. We're not a trial or anything like that. But again, clear violation, an exorbitant amount. I actually went out to the property and viewed the property last night and got out of my car and walked around the neighbor's lot just so I could see what they see. And it's right in the back corner of their yard. It's not in the center of their yard where they would be less impeding on the neighbors. It's right up against that fence, and they're not free-range chickens, so they're not running around. There's, there's fencing around it. If my neighbor put that fencing up, I would go over there at night and cut it down with wire clips because it's pretty ratty looking. It's not nice fencing. It's not a nice little fence. It's chicken wire, like you would see on a farm, mm -hmm. which we don't have in Foxmore Fairfield. So. I have several concerns. I get that we need to be accommodating, and I'm all for being accommodating, but again, I think staff needs direction to say, look into it and figure out some way to, I think when I recall when Oswego was doing theirs that they really took into consideration that easement area where it was forcing people to center them in their yard. And a clear permit process for the coop, a Rubbermaid storage container is not a chicken coop. They require power because of electricity, heating in the wintertime and things like that, because what happens then? So again, I think we need a lot more investigation by staff to come up with a good right. accommodation. So that would be my direction would be that. And again, look who at is it. the accommodation for? Who, who was it requested for? And then who's actually benefiting from having the but chickens? Now you're getting into the question, you're questioning. The letter would obviously, if it was from the VA, and I'm not sure if Brittany's a vet or not, would be right. in her I'm, husband's name. But it, so that's now what you I'm get saying. into the Whose questioning of that. Right. And based farther than that, there's a lot that we can't prove. And, and even if, if, if there's support in the room, it doesn't mean she can't enjoy them also. So, right. so that's not a determination right. that. Yeah. No, but, but, these are, but these are all things that staff. Correct. We would certainly make to. sure that um, both prongs are met before any accommodation were to be reviewed. Um, number one, you know, as far as we can investigate under the act, that you know the documentation that was required was in fact provided, and then second, if it did meet that threshold, um, whether or not a reasonable accommodation could be granted in this particular case. And I would just like to add, I mean, clearly we're we are obviously open to providing an accommodation as needed, and I don't necessarily want to speak for the whole board, but we are very um, supportive of our veterans in the community as well. So I wanted to make sure that I point that out. This, you know, we're not against any veterans. You know, we're, we're huge supporters of the veterans and we appreciate the service. Um, that, that's and what also, I was... as, if it's not abundantly clear, this issue hasn't come up before. <laughs> uh, so we're kind of working through this process. My only request to staff would be uh, to work through this rather quickly. It's summer months, folks are outside. I, I really don't want, again, uh, the use and enjoyment of your property or your property to infringe upon your neighbor. So we'll try and come to a reasonable solution uh, here in the very short term. And that, I do, 
I do, I'm sorry, Denny. I, I have one more. Sorry. Go ahead. I have one more question. That if the number of chickens are in excess of the six that are on the letter, are we in a position to say you need to reduce it down to six at this point because that's what we're working with? That would be part of the review as to what is a reasonable accommodation. I mean, if we determine an accommodation can be made, it doesn't have to be an unlimited number. We can set some regulations on. But I think what you're saying is, can we start that ball rolling now right. to downsize the, the be flock? Because if that's now. what was because it's going to take time requested, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you know, the doctor, well, medical the professional letter, yeah. said that um, they're prescribing six chickens, and there's if and I don't know if there's I'm assuming there's more from than what six, the neighbors have said determine. that there's more if than there's six. more than six, then should we be telling? Um, the homeowners, okay, you need to reduce it down to six because that will be the maximum based on what was prescribed. And, and again, um, just to be clear, there is no magic number. So I mean, a doctor could write a note saying you must right. have 100 chickens, and if that's not reasonable, then it doesn't have to be accommodated. So the reasonableness is part of the assessment. So you can't just okay. ask for anything and you know you necessarily get it. It's okay, well, 100 is not reasonable, but four is reasonable. Uh, it's right. part of that analysis and determination. Right. But if, if you know, they're currently prohibited, and if we feel that you know, the, the number now is in excess of what we think would be reasonable, I think they're asking could we have them reduce that number now while we're still investigating? Yes. Yes, because right now, I mean, you're technically not allowed any chickens, um, so you can certainly, you know, say that we know 20 is not reasonable. Okay. That's exactly what I, you took all my words. I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, I think all of all the trustees are, uh, thank your husband for his service. I mean, we're all that, we all feel that same way. We always have when other people have come in in, in the service, too. But I, I, my idea too is the same thing, that six is fine, but 50 is too many or 40, and, and where are you keep them? If you're keeping them in the house, I, don't, I can't see that at all, how you can do that code-wise. It's just not close. Okay. Uh, one, I guess, unless anybody has anything else, one thing to summarize, or actually to, to look for direction from the board is uh, when staff has come to what they believe is a reasonable accommodation. Um, since this is an administrative function, I would see, uh, generally speaking, staff moves forward with those uh, without board consent or approval. I don't think we'd be looking for board approval on something like this, um, uh, but kind of wanted to leave that, I wanted to see what the board's thoughts were on that, because what my biggest concern is to turn this into a debate then, foreshadow two weeks from now, we come back at another meeting, uh, all the same residents are here, hopefully, just because they love to come into meetings. And, um, and then we get into a debate you know, right. between the homeowner, residents, the board, our attorneys and staff as to what a reasonable accommodation would be. Right. I got one other question. She mentioned a rabbit, okay? Uh, that is an animal, farm animal also, correct? And she's got that, so it's really, does she get to keep that along with six chickens, or the six chickens are it, and a rabbit's just an extra to throw in, or uh, that's no, something to think the about. The review would be absolutely limited to whatever was requested specifically for an accommodation. Um, anything else outside of that would be subject to normal zoning enforcement. Because this, these animals are not part of that number. Our number is four domesticated animals, no two of the same species. This doesn't apply to that number, correct? Correct. So if you if we said six chickens, she could still have two dogs and two cats and six chickens. But not yeah. a rabbit. Uh, no, rabbit's an allowable animal in the village. Yes, but she, yeah, a rabbit. A fat yeah. rabbit. Not that I know. Rabbits are dirty too. They're not. You can't have coops of. So is my. Rabbits or so something. is my nineteen-year-old kid. I got kid. three in my backyard, <laughs> but it's it's they're not. <laughs> You know, <laughs> we keep him around. I get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're Thoughts on uh, proceeding administratively, or does the board want to talk about this in the future? I mean, does staff. Feel, I mean, my big concern is getting it away from the property lines mm -hmm. so that it doesn't impede on the neighbors. You want it, put it in the middle of your backyard, at the back of your property or whatever. Yeah. So and, you feel the. And again, I think it needs to be some kind of a, a structure. 
that requires maybe a code, uh, you know, a, a permit to, to build it, yep. you know, not a Rubbermaid storage shed. Yeah, those are all things we've looked at from, you know, the regulations in yeah. the other communities and what would be considered as per looking yeah. at the Yeah, so as long as staff has clear direction, then I, I'm good with it being administratively handled. Well, and I, I mean, it's, it's not a policy because we're looking at reasonable accommodation. It's not a board policy. It's a federal law. So I don't think we, I mean, we could bring it back in here and debate numbers, but I, I don't think we would get anywhere. I, I don't think we have a choice to just, because we're not setting policy. It's, it's a federal law. Okay. I'm six, just for the record, number. Yeah. How many rabbits though? How many rabbits? 37. They're fuzzy and warm. If the letter says six, I'm fine with six. But I, the other aspect of that, as far as the um, service animal, that through plan and eventually to us and policy. And I, I just, I feel the need to say that the solution might also be that we can't provide, or this property can't provide a reasonable accommodation to allow this. It's not a given that, um, based on the this specific scenario and, and the area, it may not be something that's allowed. Is that accurate? Yep, certainly. The okay. record will reflect um, all the testimony you know, and concerns raised by the adjacent properties as well as um, what has been raised by the petitioner. Everything will be taken into consideration. Um, and then again, you know, to figure out whether or not something reasonable can be um, accomplished or not will be determined by staff. Okay. And just as long as we're notified before it's going to become mm -hmm. public so that we know what's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. All right, moving on. Is there any new or unfinished business to come before the board? I wanted to mention, uh, I mentioned it at our last meeting. We did, uh, the Rotary Club along with the Fox Valley Park District and then Trustee Youngerman uh, through the company he works for Twin Oaks had also gotten us some additional trees. We did get the tree planting done in uh, the Park District property out by Lakewood Creek School and um, the Park District did a, a tremendous amount of work. These were trees that were no longer going to remain in their nursery. So they cleaned out their nursery and they were some fairly large trees. Um, they did come over and do the digging. So yes, that was taxpayer dollars. However, I was able to get those directed into Montgomery. So the trees were going to be planted regardless. <laughs> but I was just able to get them in, uh, get the money or the labor and the actual resources directed into Montgomery. So we ended up with 13 trees in the ground that week and they were going to put in another one. So we would have 14 total planted out there and hopefully have some shade. Awesome, thank you. I can, I wanna dovetail off of that. And on June 20, Sunday, June 24th, in that park, which is directly behind Lakewood Creek School, the village hosts the Sunday in the park event. We have a band shell delivered, a couple of food trucks. We do free ice cream from four to five and then we have band play and just come out with your family and enjoy a Sunday in the park. You know, it's a good chance to turn the phones off and kind of reconnect with the kids and the family and the kids can play in the park and run around. We're gonna have a, Ozinga is gonna bring a concrete truck for we can get close and look at one up close and touch a truck type of a thing. So it's a great event. So that's on Sunday, June 24th. Awesome. And you can come see Teresa's trees. All right, and um, okay, so before we go on to uh, future meetings and executive session, I'm just curious to see if my eyes are going terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, does that screen look blurry to folks by a show of hands? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> just, want, just thought I'd ask that. I thought we it was my bifocals. Yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. All right, so we have future meetings, uh, village board meeting. The next one will be on June 11th in this room at 7 p.m., uh, and you can see the meetings after that. At that point, I'd like to go into executive session to discuss the acquisition of real property uh, pursuant to 5 ILCS 120 over C5. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Chicago. Trustee Yay. Trustee Marisek. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. Trustee Lee. Yes. All right, that carries. Thank you.
Wipe that off, Dale. <laughs> Please, please, please. Give them a few seconds to uh, join us here. We just need one of them. No, not the one we need. Not, not, not that the one. one. We need. Trustees. We just need one. Yeah. I know, but out of uh, respect for you to get to your seat. And for for uh, Yeah. Thanks, Pete. All right, to call the meeting back to order and entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Call the roll. Trustee Youngerman. Yay. Trustee Marisek. Yes. Trustee Sperling. Yes. And Trustee Lee. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.